Hey everyone, Forrest here with Rocky Mountain School of Photography and today we are gonna do an ultimate setup guide for this little gem of a camera. This is the Insta360 ONE R, specifically with the one inch sensor mod. Now what does any of that mean? What is the Insta360? Well, first of all, a little disclaimer. Um, it doesn't really matter for this video because this is just a setup guide, but this was provided to me from Insta360 for the purposes of this setup guide and a review that I'm gonna be coming out with in a couple of weeks. Most people don't care about that stuff, but I like to be super clear and uh, open with you guys. So I'm not receiving any money. I just did get this camera for free. And I have to say, just right off the bat, I've been blown away by it. Now, real quick, those of you looking for the setup guide, I am gonna take a minute and talk a little bit about what this camera is, because I think a lot of people haven't really heard about it. Those of you who are just here for the setup, follow the link in the description. I've timestamped everything and skip ahead to the section of the setup guide that interests you the most. I've broken it up into photo, video, and time lapse. Those of you who know nothing about this camera and who might be interested in purchasing it, I would definitely wait and just watch the first part of this video. Again, I am gonna have a full review in a couple weeks. This is by no means a full review. I just wanna talk about what makes this camera so unique and why I'm so excited about it. The reason I'm so excited about this camera is because it is modular. And that is something that GoPro has tried to do over the past few iterations by offering their mods, which are really just add-ons for the base camera. And that's been really cool to see. I'm really like a fan of GoPro adding that kind of modularity to their system. But this, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just so cool. The camera is actually modular. So let me give you guys a quick example, right? I can take the camera, let me get it to focus, there we go, and pop the battery off. Okay, well that's not super cool, but I now have the camera and I have the screen. Well, guess what? Those separate completely. So now we have a screen, little control module, we have a camera module, and they're all separate. And you might be like, well, big whoop. Well, the cool part is there's different cameras, okay? This is a 360 camera, which means it shoots all directions at all times. That's super sweet. This little camera module has a one inch sensor. That's over four times the area of the sensor in your GoPro. It's over like eight times the area of the sensor in your phone. That's super awesome and that's a game changer in this size camera. And all of this stuff works together to basically build a camera for your certain purpose. Today in my setup guide, I'm gonna focus on the one inch sensor mod because I think for most people, at least in our audience, they're gonna be looking for the best image quality in both video and photo out of this camera. And hands down, that one inch sensor mod is gonna provide that. Now, the 360, I'm also gonna make a setup video on down the line, but today I'm mostly gonna be focusing on the one inch sensor. You guys, like I said, a one inch sensor is over four times the area of a GoPro sensor. Well, a larger sensor allows the pixels to be larger, which essentially, lar <laughs> can't talk today, which essentially allows, with larger pixels, you to collect more light. Collecting more light allows you to shoot at a lower ISO and get higher quality results. And the results really are like, uh, I wouldn't say astonishing, but I would say notable, like very obvious. This in low light conditions compared to my GoPro Hero 9 is really uh, not even a comparison. This camera absolutely destroys. And the fact that I can use the same camera and pop a 360 lens on, this, on the thing and have two 180 degree directional like spherical lenses and turn this into a 360 camera is just amazing. But again, not a review today. We're doing a setup guide and we're gonna focus on the one inch sensor mod. Now with all that said, I think it's time to get into the setup. The first thing I wanna do is build this camera with the one inch sensor modification. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my little camera module, I'm gonna take my sensor module and I'm going to combine them just by pinching them together like that. Um, sorry, it's not a camera and a sensor module, the camera module and the control module. And then I'm gonna take the battery and I'm gonna clip it on the bottom. And the battery kind of holds everything together. Also, because I know some people will be wondering, there it is powering on. Um, this is all waterproof, even with the modularity, which is pretty fantastic. So what I'm gonna do right now, this camera's all built. You guys can see it's got the one inch sensor now. It's all beautiful. There's the screen on the back. Screen is kind of small, stuff we'll talk about in the review. I'm gonna pop this into a little tripod, set it on my desk, move this camera over so you guys can see, and we'll jump into the setup. All right, let's get into the setup. So the first thing I need to mention is ignore the camera over here. That's just getting a good view of this screen. We need to go over four main things today. I wanna go over general purpose settings, video settings, photo settings, and finally, time-lapse settings. Again, I've time-stamped everything down on the bottom bar as well as in the description. So if you're only interested in one of those things, go ahead and jump ahead. Second thing. 
I am not by no means at all a quick tips settings kind of person. I want you to learn and understand this camera so that you can set it up in the wide variety of situations you're gonna have to shoot in. I'm not gonna be feeding you the best settings for everything because that doesn't exist. There are settings that are good for some things and other settings that are good for other things. So. With that said, this is a learning video. I highly recommend that if this camera is new to you, you sit back, relax, maybe get some note-taking materials and actually learn this camera. It's the only way you're gonna get the best results out of it. And I can say with full certainty that a little camera like this, when you know it and you understand it, you can get so much better results out of it than if you're just shooting it on auto mode. So with that said, quick little disclaimer there, not a quick tips video. Let's go ahead and dive into general settings. All right, to get into the general settings, we're just gonna turn on the camera and then we're gonna swipe down from the top. And that's gonna give us access to our eight general settings. In here, we've got something simple like brightness is the first one. We've got lock. Lock simply locks the touch screen. If you're gonna use this thing underwater, you wanna lock the touch screen. If you wanna lock the touch screen for anything else, you can lock the touch screen. All you do is tap to lock. It disables the touch screen operations and then you can simply unlock it when you're done and that'll take you back to normal. Again, we can swipe down to get back to those. Third thing is AirPods. One of the features I really like about this is it can sync up with Bluetooth headphones. They specifically say AirPods, but it works with any Bluetooth headphones and use the microphone on the Bluetooth headphones to be your microphone for video capture. Now, obviously you're going through Bluetooth, so there will be some loss in quality there, but I have found that overall, it sounds way better using at least my AirPods speaker or microphone than it does using the built-in one on the camera. All you've got to do is tap that icon and you can go ahead and set that up. Now, the screen does turn off quite often. That's something we can fix in the other settings. To turn it back on, all you do is hit the power button and it'll come back alive. Setting number four is for the tally light. That's the front and rear indicator light. They're called tally lights in the industry, so that's what I call them. I always leave those on because I like to be able to look at the camera and visually see what's going on. From there, if we swipe over, we've got four more settings. This is simply for grid lines. It's gonna be really hard to see on my camera here, but basically with that on, it overlays a three by three grid over top of your image, which is really useful for like composition if you're trying to use rule of thirds for composition or keep your horizon straight, thing like, things like that. I like to leave that one on. I find that that's a pretty helpful one. This next one here in the upper right is rotation lock. And that's simply there to prevent the camera from rotating to vertical mode or horizontal mode. It'll keep it always on whatever mode you're on. I leave that off because I'm really always shooting horizontally. I don't really do vertical video. And if I do, I shoot wide and I crop in in post-production. This next one is voice control. I find that annoying because the camera hears me when I'm talking about something totally unrelated and starts shooting. But that setting is this bottom left. And then finally, and again, you can see the camera turning off. Finally, in the bottom right, that takes us into the more advanced settings. So let's go ahead and do that now. There's a couple things I wanna mention. All right, so in general settings, the first thing I wanna talk a little bit about is memory cards. And I have a whole video on our channel dedicated to caring for your memory cards. And I'll link it up there in the corner so you guys can check it out. Um, but if you really wanna learn how to not lose your images, you probably should watch that video and learn how to care for your cards. But part of that is doing what's called routine formatting of your card. Now, a quick disclaimer I need to get out of the way early. Formatting a card, so when you hear me say format, formatting a card erases all of the data on the card. So don't think you can just go willy-nilly like, ooh, I'm gonna format, I'm gonna format. Every time you do that, it erases the data. But if you have your data safe, whether it's in the cloud or on your phone or on your computer or wherever it happens to be, formatting a memory card while erasing all the data also restores the card back to its factory spec. And it's very healthy for the memory card to do that. You also wanna format all new cards and all cards that are new to this camera. Meaning if you take a card from another camera and you put it in this one, it's a really good first step to format it. So how do we format the card? All we've gotta do is go into our settings, just like I showed before. Let me swipe over, we'll go to the little gear. And then if we scroll down, there's a whole section for SD card right there. And in there at the bottom, there's a format SD card button. I can tap that, hit confirm, and that will format the card. Super simple, takes 10 or 15 seconds, erases all of your data, but it's really good for the card. If you guys get in the habit of routinely doing this after each shoot, after you've downloaded your footage, go ahead and format the card. Your memory card's gonna last a lot longer and you probably will never get corrupted images or corrupted files on the card from now until you stop using this camera, which is super awesome. 
All right, the next thing I wanna show you guys is the screen turn off, because it drives me crazy. So we're gonna go back here and we're going to scroll to screen auto sleep. It's just a couple above memory card. And we're gonna go to timer. And right now it's on 30 seconds and I'm gonna change it to three minutes so that my screen will not sleep for three whole minutes. I find that really useful. You guys can obviously set it to your heart's content. Obviously, the longer that's set to, the more battery life it's going to use. So keep that in mind. I've found though that these batteries actually do really well. So I think three minutes is a good bet for me. From there, I'm gonna back out of general settings and we are gonna get to the next section of this video, which is the video specific settings for capturing really good video. All right, so when it comes to capturing good video, we need to make sure we're in video mode. So to do that, we're gonna get out of any setting screen you happen to be in, tap in the lower left-hand corner. You've got photo mode, video mode, and then custom modes. We're gonna to go to video mode, which is the middle one, and then we're gonna swipe up or down to make sure we're not on time lapse or time shift, that we are on standard video. And if we select that, you should have a little video camera icon in the lower left-hand corner, and that means we're in the right place. Now, video settings, photo settings, and time-lapse settings can all be changed on the camera or on your phone. So if you don't wanna worry about messing with this tiny little touchscreen, the app gives you full control over all of these things as well. In order to change them on the camera, all we've gotta do first off is go to the lower right-hand corner and tap. So we can tap down there. And that gives us a selection of frame rates and resolutions. And that's the thing that I wanna spend the first bit on today is what's the difference and when do we use which ones? First of all, now that we're in here, we're gonna be, you might be on basic. We wanna go to pro mode. Pro gives us all of our frame rate and all of our resolution options so that we can make the best decision for our given use case. Now, in the top here, we've got our different resolutions. And you guys can see it ranges from 5.3K, 4K, 2.7K, 1080p is the lowest. And then for, for frame rates on 1080p, we have 24, 25, all the way up to 120. So what does that all mean? Well, here's how it breaks down. Let's talk about resolution first. Resolution, very simply, is how many pixels are captured for every frame of video that you shoot. So example, if you're on 4K, Every frame of video, meaning when you're shooting a 30 second clip, that's 900 frames, give or take. Every frame that shoots has 4,000 pixels across by about 2,000 pixels up. 5.3K has 5.3 thousand pixels across by, you know, two and a half thousand up, so on and so forth. It's how big each frame of video is. Now, what are the advantages of higher resolution? Well, one of them is that it will look crisper. Your footage will look sharper, look crisper, look nicer. It'll have that really professional looking look to it. Another advantage of shooting high resolution is that you can punch in, you can intentionally digitally zoom into your footage to uh, pull out certain parts. Like if you, you know, shot something a little bit too wide, you could basically zoom in in your editing program. And if you shot at a high enough resolution, you'd be able to do that without losing any quality. That's awesome. Now, why wouldn't we shoot at the full highest resolution all the time? Well, there's a couple disadvantages. The first disadvantage is that higher resolution means it takes up more space on your memory card. It means it takes longer to download, longer to work with. You need a faster machine to edit it on and on and on and on. So with high resolution comes bigger files that are harder to edit. And so we need to keep that in mind. The second thing is with higher resolution comes more limited limitations on your frame rate. As an example, you can shoot the lowest resolution, 1080p, at 120 frames per second. The highest resolution, 5.3K, can only be shot at 30 frames per second. So now that we understand what resolution is, it's simply a number of pixels per frame of video, and we understand some of the advantages and disadvantages, let's look at frame rate. Frame rate is for every second of video that you shoot, how many frames get captured? And obviously one frame has the number of pixels that we set with our resolution. So as an example, if you set your camera to 30 frames per second at 4K, that means that every second your camera records 30 still pictures. That's actually what video is. It's just still images shot really fast. 30, 30 still images captured, and each still image would be 4,000 pixels by about 2,500 pixels high. That would be 4K at 30 frames per second. Well, what's the advantage of more frames per second? Because this camera can shoot 60 or even 120 frames per second at 1080p resolution. Well, the advantage is this. The more frames you have, the more you can slow things down. Let me give you guys an example. 
Right now, I'm shooting this video in 24 frames per second. 24 is a very slow frame rate. In fact, it's the slowest frame rate that videographers commonly use because it's as slow as you can go with things still looking smooth. Well, why am I shooting 24? I'm shooting 24 because it looks really cinematic, it looks really professional, it looks really nice, but what I don't have is any ability to slow this video down. Watch me slow this video right now. You guys see how chuggy it looks as I move my arm back and forth? This is 24 frames per second viewed at 50% speed. It doesn't look smooth, audio doesn't match up, bad stuff, right? So. The more frames you shoot, the more room you have to slow things down. If you shoot 60 frames per second, you can slow it down half speed, which is awesome. If you've got a snowboarder hitting a sick jump, doing something cool, you can slow that down to one half speed so that they're like right moving all slow during the clip, and that's awesome. Say you're a skateboarder and you want even slower slow-mo, right? You could go to 120 frames per second and run at one fourth or even one fifth speed to really slow down the kickflip you did or whatever like cool skateboarding jump you do. Why did I use that example? Well, skateboarding moves really quickly and you kind of want to match your frame rate to the speed of the action if you plan on slowing things down. Now, if you're shooting snowboarding and you're shooting a video of a snowboarder going down a hill and you have no desire to slow it down, no reason to use a faster frame rate. Get the higher resolution so it looks beautiful and crisp. But if you want to slow things down, you got to use a faster frame rate. Faster the frame rate, the more headroom you have to slow things down. Now I say slow things down, I always mean in post-production. That's something you do in the app, the Insta360 One app, or in whatever video editing program you use. So with all that said, what are my recommendations? Well, it's actually really straightforward. Let me go ahead and turn on the camera and we'll look at a couple examples here. First of all would be your general purpose setting. And I would say for most people, you don't really know when, especially with an action camera, something cool is gonna happen that you might wanna slow down. So in that instance, I might go to the lower right here and if I was just gonna leave my camera, I'd probably leave it on 4K at 60 frames per second because that's gonna give me a little bit of an ability to slow stuff down if something cool happens, but I'm still getting the high, uh, nice crisp image that 4K has to offer. Now, if you're gonna use your Insta360 just as like a vacation camera and nothing really cool is gonna happen that's super fast, what I would do is I'd go to 5.3K at 24 frames per second because that's gonna give you the highest resolution and that 24 frames per second is gonna give you the most cinematic, nice, just good looking professional video. The third option is what if you're gonna do something super sweet with a lot of movement and you wanna slow it down a lot. In that kind of an instance, I would go all the way down to 1080p and I would go to 120 frames per second. And you guys, this touchscreen's a little bit of a pain. I mentioned that on the GoPro touchscreen too, specifically with frame rates actually, I don't know why it's such an issue here. Um, but we can go to 1080, 120. That would be for very specific instances when things are gonna move incredibly fast. 1080 is not high res, so it's not gonna, I mean it is, okay. Video purists, yes, 1080p is high definition video, but these days it's pretty low resolution as far as things are concerned. So you're not gonna be able to punch in, you're not gonna have that super crispiness to it, but you can slow it down a lot. For me personally, I'm gonna put my camera back on 5.3K at 24 FPS, because that's what I'm gonna use this camera for most of the time. I'm not an extreme sports athlete, so for me, it's just gonna be a general walking around camera. That was by far the most technical part of this setup guide was frame rate and resolution. So hopefully that makes some sense. The other video settings we need to worry about are gotten by swiping in from the right side, not down like I just did. There we go. So we swipe basically to the left and we're able to set some more settings. Now, what do these mean? Well, you guys, there's basically two modes of operation for your camera, manual and automatic. And we'll break those down in a minute, but before we do that, we need to go to this top one over here on the left column and talk about color profiles and zooming ratios. A color profile is how much color saturation there is in the video that's coming out of the camera. If you want your video to look super saturated and punchy as soon as you get it off the memory card, you're gonna wanna go up here where to this top color profile, mine says log, and set yours to vivid. Vivid's gonna add punchiness, add intensity. If you want it on standard, standard's not gonna add too much, but it will add some contrast, some saturation. Final option, if you are a professional videographer and you're trying to apply your own creative color grade, you really wanna get into editing and all that kind of stuff, I recommend putting this on log. Log is very flat, very muted, it does not have a lot of color, but it gives you, the videographer, the headroom to add color, add saturation, add contrast 
to the level that you wanna add it to. So again, super simple. I think this is totally up to you as the videographer. I recommend Vivid or Standard for most people, but if you are trying to get the best results out of your camera and you want to edit, you wanna do post-production, Log is gonna give you that ability. The second thing in here is linear. It's not might not say linear for you, it might say wide or ultra wide, but this is your lens profile. Now I wanna make something abundantly clear. This camera does not have a zoom lens. So it's not like the camera is actually zooming when you go from ultra wide to wide to linear. All it's doing instead, is actually just cropping in on the video. So instead of seeing the whole what the whole sensor has to capture, it's cropping in a little bit. Excuse me, long video. I'm gonna make this super simple. If you're gonna use this camera as an action camera, go to ultra wide. Ultra wide is gonna give you that super fisheye cool effect where your viewer is super immersed in what you're doing. If you're gonna use this as just a standard like vacation camera, I would go to linear. Linear will remove that fisheye effect, keep things straight up and down, and be a much more standard looking camera. For me, I leave mine on linear almost all the time because again, I'm not doing action camera type things most of the time with this camera. From there, I'm gonna hit the back arrow and now we get into the two modes of operation. We either have auto or we have manual. You guys, I highly recommend that if you just bought this camera, learn frame rates, learn resolutions first. Get used to the zooming profile, the color profile, and then just set the camera to auto. It's gonna do a great job. But as you start to learn a little bit more, you might wanna jump into manual and just start to understand what shutter speed does, what ISO does, what white balance does. Because if you do, you're really gonna gain a lot of control over this camera and get a huge ability to increase your image quality. So let's go ahead and do that. First of all, auto is right there. So if you get like in over your head, boop, done, set it on auto. I'm gonna go to manual though and explain what these three settings do. So you guys, we've got three settings to work with here. Shutter speed is the top one, that's this one right here. We have white balance and we have ISO. Now, ISO and shutter speed, the top one and the bottom one, both have to do with how bright or dark your image is. White balance has to do with what the colors in your image look like. I'm gonna start with white balance. White balance is simply making the whites look white in your final image. And you guys can probably see that white balance by default is set to auto. So the camera is set to manual, but white balance is set to auto. As I cycle through these, you'll notice that the color of this table in the center of my frame starts to change. You see there it's blue, there it's getting a little bit warmer, a little bit warmer, a little bit warmer. You guys, these are just what are called Kelvin temperatures, and they're basically just controlling how warm, or yellow, or red, or cool, blue and green and those colors, your final image is. They are kind of preset-y, so like 5000K is really made for bright sun, like daylight, so if you're gonna go out on bright sun and you put it on 5000K, it would probably look pretty normal. 6500 is more designed for a cloudy day, 4000 is more designed for like um, your specific types of light, like when you're under candlelight or warmer light, that's really what 2700K is for, is like a screw-in incandescent light bulb. Basically, you can cycle through these and you can look at the preview in the back and the one that looks the most correct is the one that you should go with. Now, here's a quick thing. I recommend that if it is a sunny day, you take the time to put it on 5,000 Kelvin. Why? Well, auto for white balance means that the camera is constantly going to be adjusting and altering the white balance based on your lighting situation. And sometimes if you have a lot of green foliage in your image, the camera's gonna see all that green foliage and it's gonna try to, it's gonna think that the image is too green and it's gonna remove some of the green and throw some magenta in there, making everything look really weird. So I would get used to adjusting this and setting it manually. It's not that complicated. There's basically one setting for each type of light that you're gonna be under. Um, right now it's a bright, beautiful sunny day, so 5000K would be the right choice. If it was cloudy, 6500K would be where I would go. Um, if it was uh, a little bit more orange of a type light, I would go to 4000K and then 2700K would be for like, if I was shooting indoors at night with like a screw in incandescent light bulb, that would be the good result there. You know, your standard like bulb, bulb with a little wire inside of it that heats up. So auto's fine, 
but auto is gonna change as you, the lighting changes, and that can make your video look kind of inconsistent. So for today, I would put this on 5000K. In fact, I'm usually gonna be shooting on a sunny day, so 5000K is like a good set it and forget it setting for white balance. All right, that brings me to ISO and shutter speed. Both of these have to do with how bright or dark your image is going to get. Now, I need to make something super clear. If these are set wrong, your image could be black and your image could be white. So just keep that in mind as you're shooting. Uh, you really don't want to uh, <laughs> uh, mess around with this and, and feel like you're doing, it. You, you'll know you're doing something wrong, right? So just make the picture look good on the screen and then you know you're doing something right, okay? So let me take a look at that. Let's go to ISO first. ISO is this bottom one. You guys, ISO is your sensor's sensitivity to light. The lower your ISO, if I go down to 100 down here, the less sensitive your sensor is to light. And you can see because we're making our sensor less sensitive, the image is darkening back there. So hopefully if you've got your own camera, you can go to ISO and start stepping it up and you'll notice with each step, your image gets brighter. Sweet, pretty cool, right? The problem is as you go to higher ISOs, your quality goes down. You start to get what's called noise, which is this nasty speckly grossness in the backgrounds of your images. So you wanna keep your ISO as low as you can. And if you're shooting on a bright sunny day, you should have no problem doing that. So I'm gonna put my ISO at 100 because 100 while the darkest is gonna give me the highest quality result in my final video product. Now you guys can see the danger here. If we were on auto, the camera could be jacking the ISO up to 3200 and we wouldn't even know and we'd be capturing this super grainy, noisy footage that doesn't look very clean. So lowest ISO is gonna give us our highest quality image. Now, you'll notice that my picture now is a little bit dark, so we need to compensate somehow, and that's where shutter speed comes in. Shutter speed is also a control of how bright or dark your image is. And you guys can see as you go through your different shutter speeds, your image is either gonna get brighter or darker depending on the shutter speed you select, okay? So you guys can see if I go down to like 1 40th, that looks pretty nice. That table in my screen looks just like the table here in this room. So 1 40th of a second at ISO 100 would be a good choice in this room. Think about this. If the camera had made that decision, it might have made a different decision that resulted in the same brightness by maybe picking a higher ISO and giving me worse quality. So I really recommend taking a second to just set that and make it happen. Now, a couple quick disclaimers here. Number one, if you're shooting under changing lighting conditions, like say you're mountain biking down a hill, probably doesn't make sense to be on manual because you're gonna need it to get brighter and darker depending on where you are. In that case, I would shoot auto, uh, full auto on the camera. But if you're shooting something where the light's not changing, taking a second to do this can really get you great results. Second disclaimer, you'll read online that the best video happens when your shutter speed is double your frame rate, meaning I'm at, 124, I'm at 24 frames per second, so my best shutter speed is 1 50th. The problem is 1 50th makes everything look a little bit too dark, and on a bright sunny day, it would make everything look a little bit too bright. And the only way you can follow that rule is if you have neutral density filters that you can put on the front of your lens. Neutral density filters are filters that brighten or darken your footage. I have one on this camera right here. You guys can see as I twist it, twist that around, I get darker and brighter. And that's so that I can maintain a constant shutter speed of double my frame rate on this camera. Long story short, forget all that stuff really if you, if you want to. Long story short, it doesn't matter too much on a camera like this. Set your shutter speed to whatever makes it look good. Keep your ISO as low as it can be. Now, sometimes you're gonna run into a situation where you set your shutter speed to the brightest one, like 1 30th of a second here, and then the image is still too dark and you'll need to go to your ISO and bump it up a couple stops. That's totally fine. Just try to keep your ISO as low as you can. That's a lot of information, you guys. That's a lot of stuff. I hope you like recognize how much of a pro you're gonna be. Um, that's really all there is to setting video. All you gotta do from there, I'm gonna go back to my settings that I think worked, looked really good here, is just close that little thing, hit the check mark, and then you just push the button to start recording, push it again to stop, and you're gonna shoot some really quality video. So I hope that makes some sense. Really, it comes down to frame rate, resolution. Those are gonna be the two most important. And then if you want to, you've got your field of view, which is wide, narrow, tight, linear, those different options. Your color options for vivid, saturated, like vivid, the saturated colors, normal or log, which is like the, I wanna grade it down the line. And then you've got your shutter speed, your ISO, and your white balance. 
together, they all go together to make this camera have a lot of really great options. Those are your video settings. All right, let's do photo. All I gotta do to switch over to photo mode is tap this little icon in the lower left, go up to the still mode. You'll notice there's standard HDR, burst, interval, and night mode. What we're gonna focus on today is standard because I'm gonna assume that we wanna get the best results out of the camera. The one exception to this is I will sometimes use HDR mode if I'm shooting on a day where my subject is not moving and I am outside in a situation with a lot of contrast. So outside on a bright sunny day would be a great example. However, we're gonna focus more on standard mode and getting a really good result just using the camera as a camera. I'm gonna go ahead and tap that and select it right there. Now from here, in order to get to our settings, we're gonna go to the lower right and tap, and we have a couple settings here. First is for our aspect ratio. I recommend always shooting three by two because that's the actual aspect ratio of the sensor, so it's gonna give you the most pixels. If you wanna crop in afterward, feel free, but 16 by nine is kind of auto cropping, and I don't really wanna do that. I wanna shoot as many pixels as I can. This next thing is just a self timer. How many seconds do you want it to wait before it takes the picture? If you're using a group shot, like shooting a photo of you and some friends, definitely self timer's awesome. But for me, I'm gonna leave it on off for right now and hit the check mark. Now the other settings can be accessed just like video by swiping in from the right. And I always mess that up. There we go, just like that. Again, there's different modes we can operate our camera on. At the top, there's auto, which is just gonna do full auto. Then we've got manual. We have ISO priority and we have shutter priority. And all of those are gonna operate a little bit differently. Again, if you wanna just use auto, I highly recommend going to auto and then also going in and making sure your white balance is set to auto. That way the camera will make every decision for you and it'll do a pretty good job. It'll work in most instances. The thing is, I think a lot of us probably want a little bit more control and want to ensure that things work a little bit better. Now, at this point in time, I highly recommend that if you guys do not understand f-stops, shutter speeds, and ISOs, you take a minute to go watch our basic exposure series on YouTube. I'll link it up there in the corner. Go watch that because you really need to understand how shutter speed, f-stop, and aperture all play together on this camera before I continue with the still photo settings. Now that you've watched that video, you understand what f-stops, shutter speeds, and ISOs are. Now this camera has a locked aperture, a locked f-stop. It's always locked wide open at I think f3.2. So we can't adjust our aperture, but we can adjust our shutter speed and our ISO. And all we've got to do, if we go to manual mode, we right here have everything we need. We have a setting for shutter speed, we have a setting for ISO, and we have a setting for white balance. And just like that, we're able to control it. Now white balance, if you go back and watch the video setup guide, I talked a little bit about how white balance is the color of light. And essentially, if you just set it, you can see it changing in real time behind here, and you can just set it to a mode that makes the image not look too blue or too yellow. In this case, 5000K looks perfect, this table looks gray, and that chair looks gray in the background, so that's awesome. Now, shutter speed is set right here, and you guys know if you watch that video I just, I just linked, that you can change your shutter speed, and as you go to a faster shutter speed, your image is gonna get darker. So if I go to 1 1 20th of a second here, we can see that my image, and I go to a little bit lower of an ISO, we can see that my image in the background is getting darker, as I make those changes. So you guys, really, we have complete manual control over this camera. We can change the shutter speed and we can change the ISO, and the aperture is gonna stay locked at f3.2 all the time. But with just those two controls, we can control how bright and dark the image is. Now, you gotta keep things in mind, like not making your shutter speed too slow to handhold the camera, little things like that. But overall, that's really powerful. Again, we can also go to auto. We also have ISO priority, that's where we we pick an ISO and the camera adjusts the shutter speed automatically to make that ISO look proper. Same is true with the next one. This is shutter priority. We pick a shutter speed and the camera picks an ISO to make everything look exposed properly. Really powerful controls here. For me personally, I'm gonna probably find myself leaving mine, excuse me, on something like shutter priority uh, with a shutter speed of something fast enough to handhold. Um, so maybe like a 15th of a second, something like that. And then allowing the camera to pick an ISO that will give me a properly exposed result. Again, with white balance, I'm normally shooting under a sunny day. So 5,000 Kelvin is gonna be my go-to setting. 
I should point out that this camera does shoot raw. In fact, it shoots DNG files out of the camera and it's actually defaults to doing that. So just by being on the standard photo mode, if you take a picture and you look at it on the computer, you'll notice that there's a JPEG and a DNG written down every time you snap the shutter, which is great. You don't have to put it on raw or do anything extra. It always shoots raw plus JPEG. Now, if, like I said before, you are in a situation where you are wanting to capture images in very high contrast situations, like on a bright sunny day, what you might wanna do, like I said before, is go to the HDR mode, which again, you tap in the lower left, swipe up one and select HDR. HDR will not work well with moving subjects. So if you've got like a little kid zipping around, it's not gonna work great. If you're shooting like a motocross race, it's not gonna work great. But if your subject is stationary and you've got high contrast, this can be a great way to make images happen. There will be a couple seconds of processing time because the camera is actually shooting multiple images and stacking them together, but your final result will be really nice. So that is photo mode. Again, I'm sorry to say, go watch that other video, but you really need to understand f-stops, shutter speeds, and ISOs in order to set this camera up properly. All right, we made it. It's time to talk about time-lapse settings. Now, a couple quick things. Time-lapses, for those of you who don't know, are great ways where your camera shoots a bunch of still images and puts them together into a video clip. And what it does is it takes long like events that happen over a long duration and it compresses them into a really short digestible video clip. They're super, super awesome. Now with time-lapses, all of the settings we already talked about with video completely apply to time-lapse. So watch the video setup section first and then watch this one. The only time-lapse specific setting that we need to worry about that doesn't apply to video is what's called a capture interval. A capture interval controls how long between still frames should the camera wait as it's capturing those stills that it will then put into the video. I'm gonna make it really simple for you guys. You want in an average time-lapse to capture about 900 pictures. Why 900? Well, I find that most people want their finished time-lapse to be about 30 seconds long. I think that's a really enjoyable length for a time-lapse where you can see what's going on, you have enough time to enjoy it, but it's not too long that it bores your viewer. So if you're going for a 30 second time-lapse, you're probably gonna want that time-lapse to play back at 30 frames per second. Well, 30 frames per second times 30 seconds is 900 pictures. So we need to take 900 still frames in order to build a nice time-lapse. So what you can do is estimate how long your event is going to be. So let's say that you're shooting an hour long event, which is what, 120, no, that's two hours, 60 minutes long, right? Well, 60 minutes, there's 60 seconds per minute. That's 3,600 seconds. You can do some math. Basically, if you break down the math, you can figure out how many seconds per image in order to get 900 frames by the end of the event. Just to do the math, super simple. If it is an hour long event, I'm gonna get my phone out here and my calculator. If it's an hour long event, that's 60 minutes, which is times 60, 3,600 seconds. And if we want 900 pictures in that 3,600 seconds, we can take 3,600 divided by 900 and we can get four. That means we wanna wait, take four, every four seconds, we wanna take another picture. And if we do that over an hour, we're gonna end up with 900 frames. So that takes a little bit of math, but you guys, it's really easy. If it's an hour long event and it's four seconds, if it's a two hour long event, then you're gonna want it to be, got a little fuzzy in front of me, you're gonna want it to be twice as long or eight seconds. So you can base your interval off of how long the event is gonna be. All right, so how do we set all of this up? Well, first we need to put our camera into time-lapse mode. In order to do that, I'm just gonna tap in the lower left. You might be on photo mode already. We're gonna go down to video and we're gonna swipe in order to put ourselves on time-lapse. You'll notice there's also time shift. And this is a cool feature, but this is one of those more advanced camera features. We might make a video on it down the line. For now, normal time-lapse. Now, again, all of the other settings are just like normal video mode. The only thing that's unique is we're gonna swipe in from the right we're gonna to go to the top one. And you remember before on the top one, we only had color and the field of view. Well, now there's another one that is our interval. And you guys can see it right now, mine's set to 10 seconds. I would set this to whatever I just calculated. Again, in order to get 900 pictures, in the duration of whatever event it is you're shooting. If you're driving across the country for 12 hours, you're gonna have a really long 
duration here. Let's go ahead and do that. So let's say we're doing 12 hours. Well, super simple math, 12 hours times 60 minutes per hour is 720 minutes. Multiply that by 60 to get how many seconds? 43,000 seconds in 12 hours. Well, we want 900 frames. So we're gonna divide by 900 and we're gonna find we want 48 seconds per picture. So we want a picture and then 48 seconds and then another picture. So interval here, we could go to 30 seconds. We have a 30 second option, which is awesome. Or we could go to 60 seconds. 60 seconds is gonna give you a shorter time lapse in the end. It'll be a little shorter than 30 seconds long. 30 seconds is gonna give you a longer final time lapse. So you can kind of decide how much detail. I'd probably go 30 seconds right there and call it a day. And now my camera is set up for 12 hours of shooting. Obviously you'll need batteries, you'll need you know whatever you need to do that, but at least the settings are there. So all the rest of the time-lapse settings are all just like video. So watch that section there for the full overview. All right, you guys, with that, we are done. That is the setup guide. There are other modes of operation in this camera, but that's the general overview. We've talked video, we've talked photo, we've talked time-lapse, general purpose settings. You guys are pros now. You should hopefully understand your camera. Get out there and shoot. The biggest thing I can say is play with this stuff. There's a time and a place for auto for sure, but there's also a time and a place to maximize the quality coming out of your camera. And whenever that's the time, I highly recommend watching this video again to fully understand everything, really start practicing it, and hopefully this stuff will start to make some sense. If you guys like this video, it did take a lot of time to create it, so I would really appreciate you hitting that like button if you got some value out of it. If you didn't like it, you know what to do. If you guys have a question, comment, leave it in the comment section down below. And lastly, hit subscribe down in the corner to stay up to date with future videos. We will be posting a review of this camera versus the GoPro Hero 9 in about a week. So you guys should definitely subscribe and stay posted for that if you're interested in learning more about whether I think this is actually a viable camera for most people. Hint, hint, it is. Uh, but we'll get more into the details when we do the full review. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. I'll catch you in the next one.